Fortnite Battle Royale, PUBG, Fortnite Save the World, Scrap Mechanic, Grounded, Valheim, Raft, Lens Island, Core Keeper, B Rising, Vampire Survivors, Darksburg. What do all these games have in common? They are games I played over the last five years and they all released into early access. These are the early access games I put the most time into, but there are many others that I tried for an hour or two. In the prior 35 years I played video games, I can't recall ever playing an early access game. Nowadays, just about every survival game, the genre I have gravitated towards most recently, releases into early access. The primary reason for this, according to the developers, is to work with players to make the best game possible. This seems like a great idea, but does it actually work? That's why I'm making this video. I want to know if the primary motivator of working with players has been successful, or if there is another hidden mode of driving the increasing number of early access games. To do this, I'll be looking at player retention for games that were released into early access that I have played or own and plan to play soon. I narrowed the list down to games that were released in the last five years, had at least 1,000 Steam reviews, and had at least 400 players in the first month. The games we'll be looking at are Raft, Green Hell, Breathage, Subnautica Below Zero, Grounded, Dismantle, Scrap Mechanic, Valheim, Lens Island, Long Venter, Core Keeper, The Planet Crafter, and V Rising. Before we begin, I want to mention this video isn't meant to rank these games against one another. It is meant to show how well early access games, in general, do at retaining players. To measure this, we'll be looking at both peak and average players for each game at different time intervals, as well as how often players finish them after they were fully released. I used information from SteamCharts.com, HowLongToBeat.com, and Steam to create the comparisons. I'll also leave a link to the file I created using this information in the description down below. First up, let's take a look at how well these games did at retaining players from release to month 3 of early access. This chart ranks the retention rate of peak players from worst to best. I color coded it with red being games that lost more than 75% of their peak player count, orange lost more than 50%, yellow lost more than 25%, and gray lost less than 25%. The key takeaways here are that every game had a lower peak player count in month 3 compared to the release month, and 6 games lost more than 3 quarters of their peak players. Next, let's look at the change in average monthly players for the same time frame. The color coding is the same as the previous chart. The key takeaways here are that every game lost at least 25% of its average players from month 1 to 3. 11 of the 13 games lost at least half their average player base, with 5 losing 75%. So what does this information tell us? First is that every game peaked in the release month. I don't think this should come as a surprise, as hype for new games is usually highest when they launch, whether they are early access or not. Second and more important is the majority of games couldn't retain even half their initial player base for just three months. Remember, the point of early access is to work with players to ensure the game can be the best possible game at full release. Before expanding upon this point any further, let's look at how these games did at retaining their players for the first six months of early access. First up again is the peak player numbers. You'll notice that this time every game lost at least 40% of its peak players in the first six months. Nine of the 13 games lost more than 75%. The key takeaway here is that after the initial hype, none of these games did anything to bring back or attract many new players in the first 6 months. Here's the 6 month comparison for average player retention. Every game lost at least 40% of its average players from month 1 to month 6. 8 of the 13 games lost more than 75%, and 12 lost at least half their players. At this point the data paints a pretty grim picture. While almost no game can retain or increase its player population over time, the whole point of early access, according to the developers, is to work with players to create the best possible game. How can that happen when the majority of players don't stick around to provide feedback? Even more concerning, is the feedback provided by those that do stick around going to help make the game better? The small percentage of players that stick around from the early access release to 3, 6 or more months later are likely the most hardcore fans of the game. From my experience with the games listed above, this results in two things happening. One, very little critical feedback is provided outside of major bugs or technical issues because the players love the game and don't want to see any flaws. Two. The feedback that is provided is likely to come from a very small group of players that want the game tailored to them. Basically, most players that try the game don't stick around, and of those that do, very few provide any critical feedback, and when they do, it's likely to alienate the average and casual players. How is this supposed to help make the best game possible? I think the answer is pretty obvious. It's not, but this begs another question. Why do most players that play an early access game stop playing soon after the early access release? I think the most common reason is lack of content at launch. If you play a game and experience all it has to offer in an hour or two, how likely are you to continue playing it? For most people, the answer is not at all until more content is released. A few of the games mentioned in this video launched with little to no content, and I stopped playing them after a few hours and didn't touch them again until many months later. This leads to the second reason I believe most players don't stick around beyond the initial launch of an early access game. Infrequent updates. No matter how much content is available at launch for an early access game, most players want something new and they want it immediately. 
For all the games mentioned earlier that I played at launch, I was able to finish all the content in the first few weeks, if not sooner. At that point, I was ready for something new, and in every case, something new didn't come fast enough. In most cases, I moved on, and for those that I stuck with, it was only because I was able to create my own content to keep me interested. Even for those games, however, I ended up moving on or taking long breaks. The third reason I think most players stop playing early access games is the game is simply not fun or interesting enough. Every year it seems like our attention spans shrink and it's harder and harder to keep us interested in anything. New games are released every week and live service games are constantly getting updated, so it's very hard to keep the average player interested in an early access game for more than a few weeks at best. At this point I could show you more graphs illustrating how poorly most early access games do at retaining players during their early access period, but I'd rather look at something more important. How well do early access games do at getting players to finish them after they fully release? For this, we'll be looking at early access games mentioned earlier that have fully released. They include Raft, Green Hell, Breathage, Subnautica Below Zero, Grounded, and Dismantle. We'll be comparing them to the completion rates with some non-early access games of the last five years. These games are Horizon Zero Dawn, Psychonauts 2, Deathloop, God of War, Dying Light 2, Call to the Lamb, and Uncharted. These games were selected based on how long it takes to complete them, and they are similar in length to the early access games mentioned before. For the completion rate, I use the Steam achievement percentages for the final story achievements for each game. All of this information is also in the file in the description down below. I color-coded the chart with green for non-early access games and blue for the early access games. As you can see, the non-early access games come out on top in terms of what percentage of players finish the game. The worst performing non-early access games have 25% completion rates. The only early access game that has above a 12% completion rate is Subnautica Below Zero. I can't say for sure, but I suspect the reason that game performs so much better than the other early access games is it's a sequel to one of the most highly rated survival games of all time. As for the rest, a picture says a thousand words. The early access process is supposed to help make the best game possible. It would seem that's not the case, or at the very least the final product isn't enough to entice most players to come back and finish the game. So what's this all say about early access? It's supposed to allow players to help make the best game possible, Yet most games lose the majority of their players in the first few months of early access. This results in fewer players providing feedback, and ultimately, from my experience, very few meaningful changes are made to the core elements of the game. Additionally, in nearly every case, the super majority of players don't play through the game when it fully releases. For these reasons, I believe early access actually serves other purposes, specifically two. First and foremost is to provide funding for a game that otherwise wouldn't be able to be developed. Essentially, early access is the new Kickstarter. In the past, if a developer didn't have the funds to develop a game and couldn't find a publisher to fund it, they would create a Kickstarter. This would allow players to crowdfund the game with the promise of getting a copy of full release, early access in some cases, as well as other perks. Now a game can be listed on Steam or other storefronts with the early access label and no promise of being finished. The second reason I believe so many games are released into early access is to outsource playtesting and quality assurance. As an early access player, you're not only paying for an incomplete game, you're also paying to test it. You are asked to report bugs and technical issues in addition to feedback on how the game works. More often than not, from my experience, it's the bugs that get the most attention from the devs and not suggestions for making the game better. That's not to say all suggestions are ignored, but again, from my experience, it's often quality of life or cosmetic changes that are made rather than things that would improve the game greatly. With all that said, I don't blame developers for going the early access route. If you could own a business and have your customers pay you for an unfinished product, pay you to test it, and have most of them not even care if you finish it, wouldn't you jump on that opportunity? After spending most of my gaming time the last five years playing early access games, I'm ready for a break. I have a backlog of hundreds of games I haven't touched, and a few new games on the horizon that will be full releases. I'm not saying I'll never play another early access game, but I definitely won't be spending the next five years playing almost exclusively early access games.